Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Urban Aviary. Today we're gonna to be talking about hatch rates and specifically um, why you might be getting a bad hatch rate and what you do, can do to rectify that problem. Because let's be honest, there's nothing more discouraging than taking all the time to produce fertile eggs or pay good money to buy fertile eggs, have them shipped to you um, just for them to, to not hatch. And sometimes even with multiple hatches in a row. I see this a lot of times uh, discourage people from continuing raising quail and actually can be the reason they quit and get out of it altogether. So rather than giving up completely on raising quail or even just incubating your own, let's do a little detective work and play detective here to figure out what the problems are. And we're gonna look at this from the perspective of somebody that's just starting their first hatch. Let's say they've, they're doing their first hatch and they get like 25% or less. You know, a really poor, it doesn't even have to be that bad, but a pretty bad hatch rate. So let's say we're past day 17, let's say we're a couple days past, we're day 19. We know that there's no more birds they are gonna hatch, all right? We're, we're way past the threshold of, of even the, the, the late goers that, that hatch late. And lo and behold, there's only a couple that actually hatched or a very low amount that actually hatched. Super frustrating. The first thing you need to do that a lot of people don't uh, actually most people don't in my opinion is take the eggs that didn't hatch crack them open find out which ones are fully developed uh, which one which ones are partially developed and then also those that didn't didn't even start to develop and then out of those that didn't even start to develop we need to determine how many of those were actually fertile a lot of people skip this step um, which, which can give you a lot of really good information. Actually, it's the biggest way you can get the information you need to figure out what you need to do right. And they skip right to blaming an incubator, uh, that they got a bad incubator, or that they just assume they've got a bad fertility rate, or, or what have you. So for scenario number one, let's say you crack open all your eggs, and they're all either, um, the, the ones that haven't hatched, obviously, they're all either fully developed or partially developed, okay? We know at this point we've got a good fertility rate, so we can rule out that we've got fertility problems because they've all at least partially developed. So why did all the other chicks not hatch then? Uh, the first thing that people usually blame at this point is their incubator, whether they're getting a bad temperature uh, reading on their thermometer or um, it's not just putting out the right temperature that it's supposed to. Um, that's the first thing I think people usually start going to that I see is they start blaming their incubator and say their incubator is the problem. And specifically, the temperature, but it's really not the temperature that's the problem in this case. It's likely that it's the humidity that's the problem. A chick that fully developed but didn't hatch usually had one of two things happen to them. One is that the humidity throughout the incubation process was too low. What happens when the humidity is too low is that chick gets too dry. It gets dried out and it sticks um, to one side of the shell. And that's exacerbated by the fact of, uh, or by the possibility of you not turning it properly, if not, the egg's not being turned enough. If you're not turning your eggs at all and have low humidity, you're gonna have really bad hatch rates and you're gonna have chicks that's, that dry up and stick to the inside of the shell and, and uh, won't develop and they die. Or they have to work really hard to get out of the shell because it's not soft enough, it hasn't you know moistened up enough, and so they have to work really hard to get out of that shell and they use all their energy to get out of the shell. This is why the last two or three days of incubation, we jack up that humidity, is so we can get that sh shell nice and soft um, so that they can, ha they can actually break through and not have to overwork themselves to break through the shell. So if you have lots of chicks that died before finishing hatching, so you've got like a like little circle around, they, they start going around in a circle, chipping a little circle away to get the top off. And if they're getting, you know, just pecked through or part of the way around, but then they died and they, they didn't um, finish hatching, it's likely that, that that's what happened is they had a low humidity and they had to work really hard and they overexerted themselves to get out of that shell and they died. And then again, um, it could also be a part of it attributed to it if it's not being turned enough, if your turner isn't working. Um, again, your, your chick will stick to the inside. So it can be a, a two-way problem or two, two things happening at once that, that can cause, cause problems with low humidity. Um, like I said before, that just exacerbates the problem when they're not being turned properly and then they've got low humidity, they just dry out and stick to the shell. And uh, obviously that's lethal to the bird. Situation number two is when the humidity is too high. What happens here is too much water gets inside the shell, permeates through, and gets inside the egg. Now there's this little air sac when they're breaking through. We always tell you put the um, pointed end down when you're hatching eggs, right? The pointed end goes down because that other end is the bigger end that they're gonna wanna chip around to get out. And that's also where in the top of that, there's a little air sac in there. So when they're going to break through, they're trying to chip it up through that and they need a little bit of air to breathe while they're breaking out through that. And now if you've got too much water, too much moisture in the air, too much humidity, 
that air sac will actually fill up with water and they'll break through that when they're trying to hatch and either drown while after breaking through that a little bit or just get enough water in their lungs to you know to be able to kill them even if they don't drown it can still kill them but out of these two things that one usually happens less usually lower humidity is the the problem um, that happens more often than a, than a high humidity problem so this isn't necessarily a problem with your incubator unless you have a more sophisticated one that actually controls the humidity via a humidity pump. And actually you just dial it in and it controls the humidity for you. Most people I think like me are, are using the, um, the standard method of uh, stagnant water um, inside the incubator via a tray or, or whatnot. Okay, now let's say that your unhatched eggs, uh, most weren't, most or all weren't developed um, and maybe a few were partially developed. What you want to do at this point is make sure or, or determine if all of those embryos were fertilized. And I'll find a video here, I'll link up to, to show you how to determine if an egg is fertile or not so you can, can find that out. If you can determine that most of the eggs were not fertile, then you've got the answer to your question right there. There's your, your problem. Um, and we'll talk, a minute, talk in a minute more about uh, how you can make sure you're getting good fertility. If the eggs are fertile, then it's likely that something has gone wrong in the incubation process at some point. And there's a few things that could have happened here. One could be that your temperature reading is inaccurate. For this reason, I really like to have a quality uh, backup uh, hydrometer and thermometer on my incubators. The one I use will actually monitor temperature and humidity via Wi-Fi and send me alerts to my phone and let me know. And it's actually saved my butt a couple of times already. I'll put a link up here for, for that uh, sensor if you want to check that out. Like I said, it's a high quality sensor and it saved my butt more than once, both on failed temperature and humidity in my incubator. And that's the second thing I'd like to point out is that there could be some kind of incubator malfunctioning happening. Uh, the most common thing is you're gone from work, power goes out, it's out for a long period during the day, temperature goes down in the incubator, power comes back on, they get it going again before you get home, um, power comes back on, it gets back up to temperature and everything before you get back home and you get home to check your incubator and everything looks good. You never knew that it spent most of the day at 70 degrees or, or lower. And that's one of the reasons I really like this sensor is because it's already saved my butt twice on, on hatches. Um, so that's something you might want to look into. Another possibility is that your eggs are too old. Um, I don't like to incubate eggs that are past two weeks old at the very most, and I try to keep it 10 days or less. Um, once you go past two weeks, um, the viability really starts to, to plummet and go down. Second thing is the temperature they're kept at. Um, if temperatures are too uh, cold or too, or obviously too hot, then that can ruin the viability of your eggs or start the incubation process too soon. Um, so the, the biggest thing that I usually see is in the winter time, um, if you have your birds outside and they're, they're not in a heated area, especially if they're laying eggs in the night, um, by the time the morning comes around and they've been sitting outside in, in the cold for a long time, that can, can really hurt the viability. So if it's winter time, you really should collect your eggs as quick as you possibly can if you're planning on hatching them. So the older the eggs are, the longer they sit in those kind of conditions, the worse the viability is gonna get. Um, I keep my eggs and I've had really good, set, good success just keeping them inside the house at room temperature. But I mean, anywhere between 50 and 75 degrees is just fine. Um, but like I say, I just keep mine on kitchen counter or on top of the fridge or something where they're out of the way. Um, while I'm collecting them and I've had really great success with that. So if this is the problem you're having, then maybe start paying attention to the temperature eggs are being kept at, the age of your eggs, and also maybe check out getting uh, that monitor to, to make sure that you don't have you know something going wrong with your incubator while you're, you're away from home. Now, we talked a minute ago about fertility. Let's say fertility is your problem, okay? If you got those eggs from somebody, um, then I would start looking for a more reputable breeder to get your eggs from in the future. I'll put a link up here in the corner if you guys are looking at getting quality hatching eggs so you don't have to worry about fertility. But let's say that's not the issue. Let's say you've got your own flock, you're getting your own eggs and you're incubating your own eggs. There's a couple situations where I can see a potential problem here. The first and most common is your hen to rooster ratio. You really should have no more than five hens to each rooster, um, but ideally it would be three or four. Five is just fine, um, but anywhere in those numbers is fine. Don't ever do more, more than five, I've noticed that uh, um, they don't get bred properly um, once you get past five to one. Another possibility is just that your rooster isn't sexually mature yet. Once you see your roosters are actually starting to mount your hens and doing their job, 
I would wait like two weeks before you actually start taking eggs from those hens and putting them in your incubator. It takes a little time after roosters start to crow and hens start to lay eggs that they actually are, are you know, at their peak of viability and fertility. And here's another thing, this isn't something I verified but I imagine could happen, um, is having roosters that are too old. Um, at some point, just like any other animal, um, once they're past their sexual prime, they the vi their viability, their fertility starts to go down. So this usually isn't a problem because most people, I think, slaughter their birds after a year for food. Um, and I'm not sure how many years it takes for a rooster to lose its viability, but I don't think you have to have any worries if you're only keeping them a year and getting a new um, round of birds going every year. But if you've got birds that are four or five years old or something, you know, that, that might be something to think about and could be a possibility. And just like people and other animals, you know, some individuals can be born with um, uh, uh, fertility problems. So it might just be that you're individ you have an individual bird that, that's having problems. That's probably uh, less likely, but that still is something that, that could be an issue. So if you've checked off all these boxes and gone through this process, you'll eliminate 99% of the potential problems you'll have with bad hatch rates. Sometimes there are weird outliers and nature just does things that we don't understand sometimes. We're only mimicking as best we can what we see nature doing. So sometimes there really just aren't answers, but 99% of the time, some one of those things is gonna be the issue. So make sure you have proper hen to rooster ratios, that your roosters are sexually mature and fertile, that your eggs are no more than two weeks old and kept at room temperature as you're collecting them before they go into the incubator. Carefully monitor your incubator conditions, both temperature and humidity with a quality thermometer and hydrometer. And then make sure that your turner is uh, functioning properly or that you are turning your eggs um, at the proper intervals. If you've got all these bases covered, then you're likely gonna have a good hatch rate. That's all for this video, guys. If you have any questions, you can email me at theurbanaviary at gmail.com and make sure to check out theurbanaviary.com for all your quail raising needs. Until that next video, remember, you guys can do this too.